This is an official recording of Paper Heart. An unofficial Warhammer 40k story. Written by Darren Davis and narrated by Delio Para. Music and other sounds by Mad Cow. Paper Heart Jarrett sees Voss Drugath through a gap in the slow-moving blanket of fog. Twenty yards away, his old friend leans out from behind the pitted rock of a lichen-covered headstone. His face is a pale, shivering contrast against the dark gray PDF helmet jammed tight on his head. Voss sees him looking and winks. Jarrett nods and wipes sweat away from his face. They are not alone. Muffled grumbles and the shifting of chilly feet tells Jarrett that the rest of the company is still there, unseen but somewhere close. Some are making themselves comfortable, attested to by the rattling of equipment, though he thinks they're wasting their time. Chances are, orders from above will move them someplace else soon enough. Their advance during the pre-dawn hours had been rapid and unopposed, a hasty plug fitted to fill a late-released gap in Imperial lines. Deployed amongst the towering gravestones and sepultures of the city's great and good, their company is part of the secondary defense line behind the Laz Cannon and Stubber teams at the cemetery wall. Fog, rising from the river beyond the cemetery wall, smothers conversation and chills the bones. By the time darkness becomes gray light, each of them is damp and miserable. Though there has been no sight of the enemy, there has also not been any sign of reinforcements moving up to support them. Jarrett knows enough to realize it is a fragile balance. The firing lines are now obscured and nothing but the call of birds rises from the far side of the wall, thin, reedy, and hidden. They wait and listen. The fog steals meaning from time, stretching it so that minutes become hours. Lamps flare, the muted glow of fairy lights from old stories. The officers extinguish them as soon as their usefulness is done. Sounds are flat and dislocated, jumped at as the harbingers of imminent attack. Over time, the men dismiss them as meaningless noise. Jarrett shifts position and brushes at the grass surrounding the headstone. Despite the cold, his tunic is soaked with sweat beneath his armor, and the dampness makes him acutely aware of the gaps between the flat plates. There are cries in the mist now, occasional at first, mixed in with guttural shouts then. Throne help them, answering screams. They have all seen the grainy pics of green-skinned giants with red eyes and clawed hands, Xenos set only upon the kill. For weeks, the planet-wide information networks have plaintively asked, Why us? into the wide blue of the sky and received no answer. At least, no answer that men shivering in the shadow of other long-dead men can fathom. His knuckles grow white on the las gun, while around him expressions become taut as jaws clench and eyes widen. They know what's coming. Voss raises his hand, his fist clenched. Jarrett responds in kind, though he feels none of the bravado the action represents. When the mist moves sluggishly aside, he can see the sheen of sweat on his friend's face. There are whispers now among the sergeants as information is passed along from captain to lieutenant and on down the ranks. Orders are relayed and confirmations are sought. Then, in their section as in others, the officers look up as if they can see the arched trajectory of lobbed munitions. INCOMING! Whistles then, faint until screaming loud. Men duck, crouching behind anything bigger than they are, behind anything at all. 
Concussions rock the ground, dirt and debris are kicked and flung into the sky. The artillery is their own, but none of them trust the gunnery sergeants at that moment. The impacts reverberate, jarring teeth and shredding nerves. The noise is beyond anything they've ever heard. Titanitis comes in its wake. They pray to the God Emperor that what lands on them is only dirt. But there are splashes of wetness too. The men further back hear close screams as a shell lands short and a section of the wall disappears into dust, along with the squad stationed there. Shouts for medics ring out, and answering them come roars from beyond the wall. Men scramble forward and rush back, tripping over each other in their confusion. Screams pick at the nerves as the wounded receive attention. The barrage stops. They rise from the ground, brushing at the dirt, checking weapons in each other. The shells might have delayed the orcs, but that is all they do. The artillery is silent. Perhaps the Imperial commanders realized the Xenos were too close to the PDF lines for an effective bombardment. Perhaps that brief roar of defiance was all they could muster. Eyes run, you lord! Eyes run! Pick your targets! The calls come from a sergeant threading his way through their section. The mantra gets repeated along the line, echoing strangely along the gravestones and fog. Pick your targets! Voss's grin is sickly. He's fucking joking, isn't he? Can't see my hand in front of my face here. The sergeant keeps moving as he delivers his reprimand. Shut up! Watch the front! Jarrett forces a tight smile. A thought strikes him. Now of all time, he is only called Voss by the abbreviated part of his surname for all the time they have known each other. Now thinking of it, he can't recall ever having used his friend's given name. Sounds again, like a thousand drum beats forming a singular whole. In amongst them, only heard when the marching feet miss a beat, comes what sounds like laughter. The noise becomes oppressive without visual confirmation. Aspects reading return trailing ghost images, adding to the disorientation they all feel. None of them knows if the enemy is behind or in front of them. Someone says exactly that and gets silenced by a muffled thump. Jarrett fits the stock of his weapon into his shoulder and holds his finger away from the trigger as he has been taught. He leans across the weapon and stares at his hand for a long moment, willing it to stop trembling. An enveloping quiet descends across the Imperial line, interrupted by an occasional cough somewhere deep in the fog. Jarrett realizes he has been holding his breath, and now doesn't want to let go of it. Fearful of being the first to break the silence, the first to draw attention to himself. For a moment, that is it. Hushed anticipation, silent fear. And then, from beyond the wall, a blaring cacophony of rage given voice as thousands of orcs roar together. The sound rumbles over the Imperial lines like a physical blow, making them cower closer to the earth as if seeking safety down amongst the already dead. Jert and Voss look at each other, mute. Then, the guns open up. The first orcs charge the perimeter, shouting wordless battle cries. Stubber's blaze and las guns illuminate the mist. Shooters rattle and answer. Chunks of stone explode from the perimeter wall and the slanted headstones behind. The men in the secondary line duck in response to the gunfire, then glance around their barricades. Directly in front of Jarrett's section, two men at the wall crumple. An explosion tears a hole through the stone and the first of the orcs comes through. It is huge, a looming nightmare partly hidden by fog and lit by the intermittent flash of las beams. Filthy, its skin an indistinct greenish-gray in the muted light. It charges forward. The yellow of its tusks and the rust of its crude armor is forgotten as the reality of it fills his sight. The cleaver it hefts in its hands is unsophisticated, but when it crushes the chest of a trooper scrabbling out of his way, it is deathly effective. It bellows wordless hate and sprays bullets straight into the second line of the Imperial defense. Another man is felled by the last of the orc's ammunition. Move your horses! 
The sergeant stands over them and they scramble up, filling the air with shafts of searing light. Three ruby red beams transfix the orc and it staggers backwards. They fire again. Jarrett's shot goes wide into the fog, but the others sear away the arm clutching the shooter. The orc stumbles, then rights itself and comes at them again, frothing blood between its teeth that looks black in the dim light. Only the sergeant isn't panicking now. Jarrett realizes dimly that the last beams have cauterized the injuries they have inflicted. The thought seems to come from outside his head, as if someone else is having it. He moves. He reacts. He fires his weapon. But at the same time, none of it is him. The orc is through the hole in the wall, rearing up before him. It shoves Voss aside with the stump of an arm. He falls and his helmet tumbles away into the fog. Jarrett slumps backwards against a headstone, panic firing upwards. The discharge sears away half of the orc's face. Time lengthens as an alien eye boils in its socket, shedding steam. The sergeant charges the creature, impaling it with his bayonet. The weapon sinks into the Xenos' flesh and the sergeant squeezes the trigger. Before he can draw the weapon back, the orc brings its cleaver down on his head. Though the blow is deflected by the curve of his helmet, his neck breaks and the cleaver slices into his shoulder, separating it and his arm from his body. He falls without a sound, a marionette with its strings cut. But it is enough. Even orcs can only take so much punishment. The creature topples forward, pinning Jarrett to the ground. He can't breathe. The alien's face is beside his own, a leering gap tooth thing from the darkest corners of his imagination. Its remaining eye hangs open, and Jarrett imagines it isn't dead, but only resting, just gathering itself for a few moments before lurching forward to tear his face off with those fetid tusks. The orcs are at the perimeter, previously in ones and twos, now in squad strength. The imperial firing line at the cemetery wall stands to meet them, holds for a minute, then buckles and disintegrates under the weight of the attackers. The secondary line comes under immediate pressure. Laz beams crackle, stubbers clatter, and the din of combat fills the graveyard. Shouts, screams, battle cries, the thump of explosions. Smoke drifts in amongst the gravestones and mixes with the fog to create a thick atmosphere of discharge. Jarrett's voice is gone. His cries have become tiny whimpers in the back of his throat. He struggles beneath the fallen alien, wriggling and pushing and twisting until he can get the weight of it off him. For a second or two, he simply lies in the dirt. The sensations are overwhelming. He can't breathe. His hearing is dulled. Every sound is felt as a low concussion in his bones. Flashes of light that leave shaded after images. The stench of blood, shit, smoke, and a creeping foulness following in the wake of the orcs that lodges in his nose and throat becomes a noxious taste in his mouth. He rises and stumbles, jarring his knee against something large and heavy on the ground. He can't make out what the lump is, but he thinks it might be another dead alien. He's numb. He turns and staggers back into the broken PDF lines, flinching at sudden noises and wondering where his weapon went. The orcs are in amongst them now, their momentum carving a bloody swath. All is a confusing mass of oral and visionary sensation, too quick for his mind to process. The fog is an apparition-filled nightmare, a disorienting place of half-seen tombstones and creatures intent on sending him to join the corpses interned here. He leans against a gravestone, his heart hammering faster than he's ever known. Nowhere is safe. Voss appears like a bloodied apparition out of the smoke and fog. His uniform is filthy, though he still has his mud-splattered las gun. He looks at Jarrett without recognition before turning and shooting blindly in the direction of the enemy. His lips are drawn back and he snarls at nothing, firing at movement and shadows. Jared is knocked to the ground by something heavy, 
that rises over his prone form like the encroaching shadow of death itself. His ribs have cracked, and the feeling of grinding bones in his chest when he takes a breath makes him wince. Somehow, he still manages a scream from somewhere deep and feral inside him. Voss is there, still firing and hitting nothing. The orc swipes him nearly in two with a black, rust-stained axe that is all density and edge and already covered in some other poor bastard's innards. Voss flops to the ground, arterial blood pumping into the grass. Jarrett swears for a moment, even mostly bisected, he can still see life in his friend's eyes. He feels warmth in his groin and the creature roars. His last conscious act before his mind retreats is to scramble to his feet and run. Run through wisps of slowly evaporating fog and thicker tendrils of smoke until his legs give out and he collapses. They find him in a shallow foxhole, behind a slab of masonry blown from the side of a building by artillery fire. Rough hands drag him out of the shadows and haul him to his feet. He doesn't resist. The lieutenant leading them speaks to him, but Jarrett can't understand what he is saying. Can't think fast enough to form a response. He stares slack-mouthed until the man shakes his head and walks away. A yellowish glow of daylight fills a sky of sullen clouds. It is quiet now. The dull crump of munitions sparse and distant. Men move back and forth across the broken urban landscape, intent on individual tasks. Jarrett doesn't know where they are in the city, but it is nowhere near the cemetery. The soldiers march past the shattered ruins of hab units and warehouses, he stumbles often, but they don't seem to mind. The road they walk is uneven, covered in debris from gutted buildings. Jarrett looks at them without emotion. He looks at the soldiers escorting him in the same way. Dressed the same as he is, they wear hollowed-out expressions, their faces pale beneath the dirt. They are the same as billions of others, all along the length and breadth of the Imperium. Conscripts, wretched from their everyday existence, handed a las gun and shoved into the furnace of mankind's eternal wars. Their walk ends when the street widens into a small plaza surrounded by low buildings. Windows empty of glass stare down at them like accusers, tracking the guilty as the small party reaches the center of the space. Another traitor comes, says a voice. Jarrett looks up from his feet and tries to rise above the fugue in his mind. The man speaking wears a high-collared leather coat, shiny black as if it has passed under a shower. His hair, drawn back from his forehead and wetted down, looks like a ribbed oil slick sweeping across his scalp. His expression is as pale and grim as those of the men half-dragging Jarrett between them. Beyond the commissar, Two men stand with their hands tied behind them against wooden posts driven into the flagstones. Other posts beside the men are empty. A hand in his back shoves Jarrett past the officer towards them. Cowardice is treachery, the commissar says, addressing a group of a dozen soldiers standing in front of the posts. Running from the emperor's enemies is as good as joining them. Why? because the traitor reveals his hand at the exact moment most likely to cause harm to the defenders of the Imperium. Can you tell me how that is different from cowardice? The soldiers are silent. They are as numbed as he is. The ones alongside Jarrett ignore the officer and concentrate on tying his hands to a post. Just so, says the commissar. It is not. And if we give death to traitors, should we not also give death to cowards? These men have damned themselves by their actions. Malingering, turning tail before the enemy of mankind, they are not fit to serve the glorious name of the Emperor. The voice ceases to make sense to Jarrett. What did the Commissar mean? 
Who was he talking about? He wants to tell the officer that this is a mistake, that he shouldn't be here, that he is only a driver of a mass transit vehicle in a minor city half a continent away, and this has nothing to do with him. The man next to him cries out, shouting at the officer until an elbow across the face silences him and he slumps forward. That draws a response from the other man, who begins to shout obscenities, cursing the commissar, the Imperium, the Greenskins, and everything else under the starved yellow sun of the world. A soldier puts the butt of his stub gun into the man's midriff, and he falls against his restraints, coughing and weeping. A soldier approaches them. In his hands, he holds three slips of white vellum. He pins one to Jarrett's chest, but won't meet his eyes. The action is repeated with the next prisoner, and the next. Jarrett stares around, uncomprehending. What is going on? It isn't until the rest of the soldiers step forward and raise their guns that it begins to dawn on him what is happening. Even then, the realization is so slow in making its way through his stupefied mind that he never really comprehends what it is. That, in itself, is something of a mercy. Jarrett thinks of a thousand things in those last moments. Snippets of a life that whirl past at the speed of light. Of his mother and father. Kissing a girl for the first time. When he cheated on his entrance exams for the city transportation department. His bashful pride at putting on a PDF uniform. His oldest friend. Split like an autumn log by a roaring alien. He looks to the sky, blinking in the light and hoping there might be a last sliver of blue to hold on to. But there are only gray clouds and a pale yellow sun hidden somewhere above them. There is a barked command from the commissar. The soldiers take aim. Another command. Jarrett never hears the final crack as the stub guns fire. You've been listening to an official recording of Paper Heart, an unofficial Warhammer 40k story written by Darren Davis and narrated by Delio Para. Music and other sounds by Mad Cow.